Now, as we've already heard so far in the debate, there are a number of different dimensions and aspects to deafness. But I want to focus on one particular issue, and that is the criteria for receiving cochlear implants under the NHS. My argument today is simple, that these criteria should be reviewed, it should be made easier to get an implant. To do so would transform the lives of those who need this technology. It would improve the lives of their families and loved ones. And it would be a prudent investment because it would obviate the need for more expenditure further down the line as a consequence of people not receiving the implants that they desperately need. Now let me tell you the story of my constituent Lamina Lloyd. Until last year, Lamina had a flourishing career as the manager of a local citizens' advice bureau. However, Lamina has many years' disease, which has resulted in progressive hearing loss, so much so that last year she had to give up work. She has two children who themselves have additional needs. She can no longer hear her children, who have to act as her ears. She describes her family life as having gone from being an outdoor family to one that now rarely leaves the house. Lamina is an intelligent, capable person. But for her, hearing loss has meant the end of her career. It has uh, diminished the quality of her family life. And it has resulted in increasing isolation. To try to alleviate her condition, Lamina wears the most powerful hearing aids available, turned up to maximum volume, but they make little difference. They give her frequent ear infections and headaches caused by feedback and the squealing noises from the hearing aids. She can no longer hear music or follow conversations and yet has been in a battle, and that's the only word for it, in a battle for the last two years to try to get a cochlear implant. She falls just short. Five decibels short. That is no more than a whisper of the 90 decibel hearing loss threshold for consideration for an implant. This threshold is one of the strictest in the Western world. It means it is estimated that only 5% of those who could benefit from this technology get access to it here in the United Kingdom. Lamada describes her condition as being too deaf to hear yet not deaf enough to get the help that could make a huge difference to her life. Her hearing has deteriorated even further in recent months, and she now has an appointment at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham in two weeks' time to be assessed. But she and many others in her position have serious reservations about how these assessments are made. The BKB test used uses short sentences in lab conditions. It does not replicate normal conversation or real world conditions. And Lamina and many others feel it is not a tool fit for the purpose of properly measuring hearing ability and hearing loss. And even if Lamina is approved for an implant, the question has to be asked, why is it taking so long? And why do we put people and their families through such pain before giving them the help that could make a life changing difference? And my honourable friend, the member for Poplar and Limehouse, raised these issues in an adjournment debate earlier this year and briefly at the beginning of his speech today. And he was told earlier this year that NICE was launching a consultation on the guidelines used for this. This has not happened. These guidelines have been in place since 2009, but technology and costs have moved on a great deal since then. And can I therefore ask the Minister a few questions to either respond to in answers today, or if that's not possible, I'd be very happy for him to consult with colleagues and write to me and the other members participating after the debate with a more considered response. First, why has the NICE consultation not been launched when it was promised that it would be launched in the summer of this year, and when will it be launched? Secondly, does he agree with me that Lamina's case and the many similar cases around the country show that there is an overwhelming case for revising these criteria. Thirdly, 
whatever hearing loss threshold is picked, does he agree that the testing of hearing loss needs to be done in real world conditions that approximate with how people actually live their lives, conduct conversations and so on? And fourthly, and perhaps most fundamentally, why does it take so long for people to get an implant? Why is this such a battle? The NHS is there for those who need it. It, is, it should not be an organisation that people have to battle with to get the treatment that they need. If my constituent had been helped earlier, she might still be in a job. She wouldn't need to rely on the state for financial support, and our family would not have had to go through the huge difficulties that they've all been through together in the last couple of years. It is time for a step change in the urgency with which this issue of cochlear implants is treated. The guidelines must be revised. The NICE organisation needs to move on this, and it needs to do so soon, so that the suffering of my constituent, Lamina Lloyd, and the many people around the country who are in a similar position can be alleviated. Thank you.